Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And as part of the Sabbath commandment that God gave to his children ages ago, he said, do not forsake the sacred assembly as part of your Sabbath. Rest in me, worship me, and let me give you the good gifts that I have for you. Jesus had a custom and it was on a Sabbath day to go to the synagogue to be part of the sacred assembly. And so that's why we're gathering. We're gathering from our homes. We're gathering here in our sanctuary to rest in him, to rest in his promises, to rest in his truth. We are here to worship him and to receive his blessings. And so it's great to be with you as we begin our worship time. I'm Justin Krupski, one of the pastors here at Trinity Lutheran Church in Utica, Michigan. We are honored that you're choosing to worship our great big God with us. And so as we begin, there's something called the Church Center app. I want to encourage you to download that on your phone, uh, check in with us here at Trinity, and then you can partner with us in our ministries and, and know more about what we're up to here. And so as we begin our worship time, may God give you rest, may He give you peace, may He strengthen your faith. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, all right, let's try that again. I, I sense that there's maybe a little more enthusiasm in the room. Good morning, church. Good morning. Yes. Thank you, Larry. Appreciate it. And welcome to you as well online. That's Jessica over there. Everybody say good morning, Jessica. Hey, and I'm Josh. And I'm so happy to be with you here. I'm on the pastoral staff here. And uh, welcome to Trinity. We're so excited. We're almost into Advent, which is the season in which we celebrate Christmas. But maybe some of you are saying, hey, whoa, slow your roll, Josh. It's not even Thanksgiving yet. So, all right, let's just stay in the moment. We have so much to be thankful for. Amen. We have so much to be grateful for this week. And I pray that as we worship today, we come before our God who has given us every reason to be thankful and grateful as his people. He's poured out his love lavishly on us through his son, Jesus. And Jesus is the reason why we are here to worship this morning. Amen. And so as we do that, let's just have thankfulness and gratefulness in our hearts. Let's start to even focus now on all the reasons we have to be thankful and grateful. And as we do that, how about we stand up and, and share maybe one thing you're thankful for with somebody around you. And if not, just say hi, welcome them. Again, welcome to Trinity. I'm thankful for all of you, just in case you guys were wondering. I'm not being cheesy at all. I, I genuinely mean this when I say I'm thankful for every single one of you because without you guys, the church, what we do would be pretty insignificant. But gathering together in the name of Jesus is one of the biggest things, if not the biggest thing that I look forward to every single week because regardless of the week I've had, we get to reset here in this place. Amen. We get to receive God's gifts. We get to re be reminded of the fact that he loves us. He's spoken a word of truth for us. He forgives us through the very body and blood that we're going to receive later in the service. And, and we get to be reminded that we are in this together. We are not alone. All right. It's really easy to feel isolated and segmented and have things compartmentalized today uh, in this day and age in which we live. However, we have unity together. Amen. We have the ability to come together from all of our different walks of life in the name of Jesus. And we do that by regrounding ourselves, reminding ourselves of who our God is and how he's revealed himself to us through his word, the Bible. And so we get to use these things called the creeds to reset, to remind ourselves, to confess our faith, to say the same things about God that he himself has revealed to us. And so as we get going in worship today, let's do that. Let's use the words of the Apostles' Creed to join together, not just with the people here in this room or with you online, but with literally all of the Christians around the world professing their faith in Jesus. And so we do so together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. And the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 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 
And there's an amazing word. I love it. David uh, knew how important it was to come and gather, to be with God's people. And so I want to share a scripture with you this morning from Psalms again. Uh, I think it's from Psalm 27. David says this. He says, one thing I've asked of the Lord that I will seek after all my life, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. He knew how good it was to come to gather, to be with his brothers and sisters, right? He knew how awesome it was to be able to see the truth of who God is and the splendor of his holiness together. And he says, I want to do this all my life. I want to be able to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. I love that. We get to see God uh, through his word, through the sacraments, and in each other. Amen. And so we have come to to see you this morning, Jesus. We've come to lift up your name, to glorify you, to honor you. And so let's do that, church. Amen. Let's be like David. Let's gaze upon the beauty of Jesus here in this place. Amen. Come on, let's do it this morning. Here we go. This is where worship starts. Here in the temple of my heart, remembering who you are and all you've done. This is your majesty, all I have tasted and I've seen, remembering who you are and once again.
just a word And suddenly I'm not afraid when you speak Freedom reigns, there is hope And every single word you say I don't want to miss one word you speak Everything you say is life to me I don't want to miss one word you speak So cry in my heart, I'm listening When sorrows roll and troubles rain
things in this place we sing of your goodness Jesus because Jesus that's who you are you are good you are so good you're so loving you're so kind and merciful and compassionate 
and patient. Jesus, forgive us when we haven't been those things. Lord, when we haven't lived um, in strive with your spirit, when maybe we fought against what you have for us that is good. Lord, forgive us, renew us, and lead us uh, to a place that says, God, we are not God. And Jesus, we need you. We need your goodness to fill us, to cleanse us, to renew us, to make us right with you. Jesus, thank you that in your love and your goodness, you came and did just that. You accomplished that. And Lord, we get to celebrate that and receive that forgiveness later. But Lord, we're reminded now too, that Lord, we have forgiveness because you said so. When you declared that it is finished, you declared that sin, death, and the devil no longer have a hold on us. And Father, we say thank you. Thank you for being good, for knowing what we need, even when we were still sinful and far off away from you. God, you came and you ran after us. And so, God, as we maybe have a lot in our minds gathering here today, this morning, Father, as maybe we're thinking about this week, thinking about maybe the places we'll go, the people we'll be with, the family, the tables we'll gather around, God, help us to bring your goodness into those places, into those situations. God, you empower us as your people, as your church to go out and to share that goodness, that love, that forgiveness with those around us. And so, Jesus, if we're needing things to be thankful for, if we're feeling like our grateful and thankful tank are a little depleted this morning, Father, we look to you and we see that we have everything we need. God, we have forgiveness, life with you, salvation because of you, Jesus. And so, Lord, maybe there's other things going on in our hearts and minds this morning. God, you know what those things are. And so, Lord, in this moment, we're going to bring those things before you and lay them down at your good feet, Jesus, because you tell us to. You tell us to come with all the burdens that we have and to lay them down. And so, Jesus, we do that now here in this place. And God, even the things that maybe we can't make sense of and even the things that maybe we're trying to put words to, God, you know what's going on inside of our hearts. And so, Lord, we pray those things using the prayer that you have taught us as your people. And together we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat, church. Thank you again for being here this morning at Trinity. My name is Josh. Again, that's Jessica. We just have a few things to share with you that are going on and happening in the life of the congregation. Um, the first is this. It's not on the announcement slides, but really quick, just in case you forgot last week, we have our Motown Soup open house going on, and we want you to know about that because it's a, a huge blessing. And so again, if you forgot about that, you can still sneak into that in the fellowship hall down that hallway after the service. And so just a heads up that if you still were hoping to get some things at the open house, it is still going until about noon today. And then while I'm giving these announcements, hospitality team, I just want to invite you forward to come and collect the offerings at this time. And in church, just so you know, you can let us know that you're here by either going into the church center app and, and recording your attendance. You can even give electronically that way if you so desire, or you can use a communication card and let us know that you're here. Um, but as the hospitality team comes forward to collect the offerings, there's just a few other things going on that we want you to be informed about church to be up to speed on. And the first is this. Uh, we have this awesome thing called Thanksgiving this week. And so what Thanksgiving means that we get to gather together as a church family and worship together. Uh, Thanksgiving Eve worship is happening Wednesday night at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary. That service will also be live streamed. So if you are out of town, you can still worship with your church family as you worship out of town with your family family. Make sense? Cool. And if you happen to be in town and you want to come join us, 7 o'clock um, on Wednesday night or 10 a.m. on Thanksgiving Day, uh, we'd love for you to come and worship with grateful and thankful hearts Jesus, uh, our Lord and Savior, who's given us, again, every reason because of his goodness to say, God, we thank you for who you are and what you're doing here in this place, in our lives, in our families, all over the place. And so Thanksgiving this week. Worship opportunities. Don't want you to miss out. Uh, what that means then is Advent is right around the corner. I alluded to this earlier. And we 
have our Advent midweek services starting back up. And there's just a few time changes that we want you to be aware of. If you are uh, some of the people who come and join us at the 11 a.m. Advent midweek worship services, those are not changing. Those are still happening Wednesday mornings at 11 a.m., the 6th, 13th, and 20th. And there'll be a, a, a lunch afterwards. And so again, if you've been blessed by that in the past, we want you to come and join us again. However, if you ever came to the night services, these are going to be more family-oriented this year, which means that on the 6th and the 13th, there's going to be a family meal together starting at 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 5 o'clock. There's been a, a few bits and pieces of information that maybe said 5.15 or 5.30. It's 5 o'clock. So we'll be able to eat together and then go up for worship at 6.15 instead of 7 p.m. Again, the whole idea is that we get you in and get you out so that if you have young kids, you can still have them to bed at a decently um, early hour if that's how your family runs. And so we're just trying to be mindful of that and create worship opportunities that are, look a little different or a little more conducive to the family as a whole. And Pastor Nick and his team are putting together some awesome services. So that's happening on the 6th and 13th. However, on the 20th, our night service will actually be at 7 p.m. because that's the school musical. And so again, I know that's maybe a lot, but we just wanted to give you a heads up so you could be ready to expect what you're walking into. It's going to be awesome. And then lastly, um, women. We have an awesome women's ministry going on here at Trinity, and there's this thing called Christmas Aglow that's happening on December 5th. And so if you and a group of ladies mom that come together and, and attend this event. Again, um, it's an awesome night of fellowship and, and, and Christian just encouragement. And so again, if this is uh, something you'd be interested in, check out the information as follows. And again, as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive God's word today, uh, I direct your attention to the screen this morning. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This week we're continuing our sermon series on the God of the possible. This is part of our larger yearly theme where we're talking about our great big God. There's nothing he can't do. And this God of the possible series is really focusing on that second part. The fact that there's nothing that he cannot do that we can trust him at all times, that he is going to take care of us and lead us and provide for us. And Pastor Justin has led us through that with the, the thematic idea of being a warrior versus being a warrior. And we saw that reflected where David, King David was a warrior, trusting that God would grant him victory over Goliath, whereas King Saul was a warrior, fearing for his own life. Pastor Justin also last week encouraged us to trust in God with the gifts that he has blessed us with, to, to return them to God and to trust that he is going to take care of us so that we do not need to worry, but we can be faithful with those gifts. This week, we're going to be continuing that theme of being a warrior and not a warrior, and we're going to do so through the ministry of Elijah. Now, in order to understand Elijah, what we're going, what we're going to see in his life is what we're we're going to see that the journey from being a warrior to a warrior is not a straight line. That Elijah, being a warrior of God, still find, found himself worrying about God and what God would be doing. And this is Elijah, the Old Testament prophet of Old Testament prophets. When Jesus came on the Mount of Transfiguration, Elijah and Moses were the two he invited to be there with him. Elijah, who is the one that was the representative of all Old Testament prophets, and yet he still had his moments of doubt. And so to, in order to understand this, we need to go back and look at the beginning and even before the beginning of Elijah's ministry to see what happens in this moment. Now, the, the kingdom of Israel had been split many, many years before the beginning of Elijah's ministry. In the south, you had the kingdom of Judah. This is where the line of David continued to reign and rule. And the dynasty of David provided some level of stability in the southern kingdom. In the northern kingdom in Israel, though, 
There was no such stability. It was dynasty after dynasty being overthrown by coups and rebellions, assassinations and civil wars. And it was just constantly in flux who was in charge, who was going to be leading the kingdom of Israel. But there was one thing that was actually very consistent in the northern kingdom. And that was that every single king in the northern kingdom failed to worship God in truth. They pretended to worship God. That's how they got some of the people to go along with them. They pretended that they would honor God, but they abandoned him completely. And things actually got worse under Ahab because Ahab eventually just gave up the pretense. Instead of worshiping God, he chose to worship Baal, the God that had been in Cana, the God that his wife Jezebel had worshiped. She brought that to him and he began the worship of Baal. And as you can imagine, God was not too happy about this. So he sent Elijah to Ahab with a message. And that message was that God was going to punish the people of Israel for their rejection of him. And he was going to do that through a drought. To show that he was, in fact, the true God in Israel and that Ahab should be worshiping him. And so for three and a half years, there was a drought on the land of Israel. Ahab was unhappy with Elijah for bringing this message. So Elijah had to run, and he lived on the edge of the world, away from everyone and everything, but not too far from God. God continued to provide for him through this drought so he wouldn't suffer its effects, unlike the people of Israel, who were suffering the drought, who were losing all of their food and their resources. And Ahab and Jezebel in particular were very stressed out about this, And finally, after three and a half years, God sends Elijah with a message. It's time for the drought to end. And God is going to do so through a confrontation between him and Baal. It was a showdown between God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, and Baal, the God Ahab had chosen. And I wish we could go into the details of this confrontation because it is a fantastic story. If you've got the time, look it up, read it on your own, 1 Kings 18. There's so much going on and there's so much nuance in the text of what is going on back and forth between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. But what I need you to know is that the confrontation was designed so that the prophets of Baal would win. From where it was located to what the confrontation itself was to Elijah's behavior throughout the whole thing, it was designed so that the prophets of Baal would win. You see, the confrontation was that each side would set up a sacrifice to their God, and they could do whatever they wanted to prepare this sacrifice, except set it on fire. That was their God's responsibility. And whoever's God lit the sacrifice on fire first would then be declared the victor in this showdown. And so Elijah he graciously lets the prophets of Baal go first. He says, you guys can have the first turn. It's okay. I'm not worried. And then he gives them all day. All day, they're spending all their time and energy trying to get Baal to light their sacrifice on fire. But given that you know that Baal is imaginary, I'm pretty sure you can guess how that went. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Until eventually, Elijah says, now it's my turn. But he's not done showing off, right? Instead, what he does is he sets up the altar. He builds this altar. He puts the sacrifice on top and says, wait, we're not done. Let's get some water and soak this sacrifice. And he has them pour so much water on the sacrifice that a trench he had dug around the altar filled and was overflowing with water. He wants to make sure you know this isn't an accident, that no one can light this thing on fire. And so then what Elijah does is he simply kneels down and offers a prayer to God. God, show your people who you are so that they might return to you. That's Elijah's prayer. And if you thought Elijah was showing off, God shows up in a big way. He sends a fire, but he doesn't just light it on fire. 
He sends a consuming fire that burns up not just the sacrifice, but the stone altar that the sacrifice was on. It burns so hot, it consumes the dust of the ground and even the water that was filling the trench around there, it consumes all of that water. God was making a statement. I am God and there is no way that you can doubt me. And that's the reaction that we see from the people of Israel. They turn to God and they say, yes, you are the one true God. And so Elijah then, with this, he takes that momentum, that trust in the, from the people of God, and he says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to eradicate the evil that is in this land. And so he has the people slay the prophets of Baal to remove the wicked, to remove the evil from the land so that God's kingdom can be restored in Israel that the true worship of God might be restored and that the people might live faithfully. And when this is done, the rains return. And Elijah has won a great victory. And so he is hoping for revival. He is hoping then to move on and begin this right worship of God. And so he sends Ahab ahead of him. He says, go to the palace. And when I meet you there, we are going to begin this revival. But when Elijah arrives so full of hope, he's not met with revival, but a rejection of God. Instead of meeting Ahab so that they can begin this process, instead what he meets is some soldiers sent by Jezebel with a warning that as soon as Ahab gives her the okay, she is going to have Elijah executed. And the hope that was in his heart sinks into dread in his stomach. And Elijah just runs. He runs away. His plan is to never be found by anyone ever again. So he flees south into Judah and then he keeps going out into the wilderness where he cannot be found. But God found him. He could not run away from God. And so God comes and finds him and gives him encouragement, encouragement that he is going to take care of him and that he is going to provide. And he sends Elijah on a journey, a journey to another confrontation. But this confrontation is going to be between Elijah and God. So God sends him on this journey up to Mount Horeb is what it says in the text. But if you do a little bit of digging, what you'll find out is Mount Horeb is another name for Mount Sinai. And so Elijah on Mount Sinai, on the mountain of God, is then confronted by God. And God comes to him and asks him a question. What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah is then able to express everything that he has been feeling and meditating on. I've been faithful. I did everything right. I have followed you. I have trusted you. I have done it all. And nothing changed. In fact, it seems like it's gotten worse, God, because I'm the only one left who's trusting in you, and they are seeking to take my life. Elijah had forgotten who he served. He had forgotten that he served the God of the possible, the great big God for whom nothing was impossible. And so God decided it was time to remind Elijah who he was. And so he sent great and glorious signs. It started with a wind, and this is not a gentle breeze, but a wind so forceful that it cracked rocks into pieces. And this wind is the spirit of God. The word ruach in Hebrew means both wind and spirit. This wind is an indication of God's spirit and his presence, but God was not in the wind. Next, God sent an earthquake. And earthquakes were a common thing on Mount Sinai. That when Moses was there, God would announce his presence to Moses and the people of Israel by sending rumblings and shakings of the earth that God is here now in the earthquake, but God was not in the earthquake. Then God sent a sign to Elijah, a very personal sign. Elijah's ministry became defined by fire from God. That was his miracle that he did there on Mount Carmel in the confrontation, in that showdown. He called down fire from heaven. And this was Elijah's sign. And yet when God sent fire there on Sinai, he was not in the fire. 
God was telling Elijah, look at what I could do. I can do all the miracles. I can do all the signs. I can do all the mighty things, but that is not how I am choosing to work. God was not present in any of those signs. He was not present until he came to Elijah in his still, small word. And in that still, small word, he brought the promises of God. If you read through the text, you get a lot of detail. But to summarize that promise of God, God was telling Elijah, your plans might have failed. Your plans might not have worked out how you expected them to, but mine have not. I am still at work. And so God sent Elijah to anoint three different men, Hazael and Jehu and Elisha, to be the ones who would bring about an end to the evil king Ahab and his wife Jezebel. They would bring about an end to that wickedness that Elijah was so worried about. And God was telling Elijah, I'm still at work. I'm still capable of doing these things, even though you are not. And so he was calling Elijah to abandon his worry, to instead trust in God and trust that God would bring about victory. Because that's what Elijah had forgotten. He had forgotten how to be a warrior. In the midst of his worry, he had let that overwhelm him. He had forgotten who God was and had abandoned his calling because of his worry. I say this not to to put Elijah down or anything like that. I say this because Elijah's story helped me as I was dealing with my own worry. It was a little bit over a year ago that God put it on my heart that it was going to be time to move on from my first call. I'd been at my previous congregation, Hosanna, for four and a half years about that time. And there were some things that I had been doing there that were going great, And there were some things that were challenges, and challenges that were my responsibility. But every time I entertained the idea of moving on and doing something else in ministry, I felt like I was running away from my problems. I felt like I was abandoning the people of Hosanna to the problems that were my fault, that I had created, and I just could not do that. And I was worried about my failures. And it didn't get better until God had me study the promises he gave to Elijah. And in those promises, I realized that I needed to listen to the voice of God, that he is indeed the God of the possible, that my failures are not his failures, that even if I leave and I cannot serve those people anymore, God hasn't left them. God has not abandoned them. God is still at work there. And more than that, by moving me on, by taking me somewhere else, he was actually opening a way for someone else to step into that role, to step into that ministry, to do things that I am not able to do. And I needed to trust in God to do that. And when I trusted God, he led me here so that Now I get to serve all of you, and we get to be in relationship with one another. We get to work together on God's mission, and God is going to continue to do great things. God's message to Elijah, God's message to me, his message to you today is to trust in him, to be faithful to his calling to you, to be a warrior, trusting that God is going to work. And even if your outcomes don't turn out the way you're hoping, God is still the God of the possible. He is still going to work in ways that we would never expect, just as he spoke to Elijah through his still small word. And I've been using the word word intentionally, because if you read this in the text, it'll say whisper. But it is through God's still small word that he chose to win victory in the way that no one expected that word that was so unimportant that we would not recognize him. That word that was so insignificant that his birthplace was a barn and his first bed was a dirty manger. 
a word so misunderstood that even his closest followers did not know what he had come to do. A word so important that his life ended in a criminal's death. And yet God chose to work through that word. He chose to work through that word to bring about the greatest victory of all. God did not choose to work through the grand miracles of the world. He did not choose to work through the feeding of well over 5,000 people or the miracles of healing or the casting out of demons. God did not choose to win victory through the might of Samson, the ark of Noah, or the parting of the Red Sea. Instead, God chose to win victory through his son. On a cross, dying in infamy. And yet in that moment, he won the greatest victory. He won victory over all evil in all the world. He won victory over sin, death, and the devil. Everything that has gone wrong in the world, everything that you have faced, every problem that you encounter, every problem that you create, he has overcome all of that. Through his cross. And God's calling to you is to trust him. Trust that he is going to win victory through Christ. That he has won victory through Christ. And when the outcomes don't look how you would hope. When you're facing challenges. When you're facing the problems of the world. Remember he is the God of the possible. And in his still small word. He has won victory for you. In his name, amen. Well, thank you for worshiping the big guy with us, our great big God. I want to invite you to our Thanksgiving services this week, Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, Thursday morning at 10 a.m. Our Wednesday evening one is streamed, so there'll be Thanksgiving services online for you and your family. And so happy Thanksgiving. Pray that you have an attitude of gratitude and that you're able to see those blessings that God has given to you and you're able to give him thanks. As we wrap up our time together, I want to encourage you to do something that we call Faith Five. Take five minutes with people in your life. Maybe it's today, maybe it's later. Talk about a high, talk about a low. Talk about this word that you heard today about our God of the possible and future warriors that God calls us to be, not future warriors. And as you move forward through the Faith Five, then go ahead and pray with each other and then bless each other. Thanks for joining us for worship. We hope you'll be able to join us again next weekend.